Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the IBP Network Implementation Stories, Experiences from Africa. I'm glad to see that so many of you have joined us today for what is the second session in our series of webinars on the IBP Implementation Stories. My name is Karen Ekman, and I work for the IBP Network Secretariat, which is hosted at the WHO headquarters. In my role at IBP, I focus on communications, research dissemination, and knowledge management. And having been involved in this process of selecting and finalizing these amazing implementation stories, I am thrilled today to be moderating this session in which we will highlight five of our winning stories. Next, please. This project was led by the WHO IBP network in collaboration with Knowledge Success. So we will start the session today uh, with some remarks and reflections from these two organizations. This will be followed by presentations from five of our winning authors who will describe their implementation experiences in five different countries in the African region. And last but not least, we will provide some time for questions and answers. Next. First, some housekeeping rules. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and you will be able to view the recording later on the IBP network platform, as well as on the HRP YouTube channel. If you have any questions to the speakers, please write them in the tab called questions, which you find on the right-hand side of your screen. You can do this at any time throughout the webinar and we will provide some time at the end of this session where we hope to address as many of these questions as possible. Please rem remember to write your questions in the tab called questions rather than in the chat. Note also that there is a tab called handouts from which you can download all the stories that we're going to talk about today. So quick background, um, while the WHO guidelines and tools on family planning uh, and the high impact practices are widely disseminated, there is limited documentation on how these guidelines and tools are actually practically implemented on the ground and what the actual impact of such implementation is. So it was in an effort to address this gap that the IBP network in partnership with Knowledge Success called for field-based stories of how the high impact practices and WHO guidelines and tools have been adapted and used in local settings. We selected 15 winning stories um, and worked with the authors to produce 15 briefs in which authors describe their experiences in their own words and with their own images. Um, and these 15 winning stories are from all around the world, but today we will focus on five amazing stories from the African region. Next. So before we dig any deeper into these five stories, I'd like to just put them into a bit of context and offer you some reflections on why I think that they are so valuable. So um, in line with, um, next please. <laughs> so in line with the WHO transformation, the World Health Organization is increasingly emphasizing the importance of impact and of making a measurable difference in people's health at country level. Now, IBP Network, based at the WHO headquarters, uh, is a network of close to 90 member organizations, uh, which work in the space of family planning and sexual and reproductive health. And the Secretariat, besides myself, also includes my colleagues Nandita Tate, who is leading IBP, as well as Otis May, who is doing a terrific job right now behind the scenes um, during this webinar. So we at IBP like to describe ourselves as a global platform for local impact. Our mission is to support dissemination and use of evidence-based guidelines and programmatic interventions in family planning and SRH. And we have three strategic goals, to improve country-level access to global guidance and resources related to effective practices, to support implementation and documentation, and to facilitate collaboration amongst partners. And we're continuously looking for innovative and creative ways of doing all of this, of sharing information, fostering knowledge exchange and leveraging the power of partnership. And so in light of these objectives, I believe the stories that you're going to hear today really reflect the core of what um, IBP and, and the power of partnership is all about. These stories also resonate well with the overall goal of WHO of being impact focused to better help countries ultimately achieving health related sustainable development goals. These stories are also testimonies of the importance of not only access to care, but of quality of care, of assuring that services are person-centered and considers the needs, preferences, and context of individuals 
and specific populations such as adolescents, and you will hear more about that during the stories today. Next, please. So why did we ask partners to share their stories? Well, storytelling is as old as humanity itself. People have always told stories to pass on knowledge and information, to capture people's attention, to engage people towards a mission and a vision, and to leave something behind for others to learn from and to grow from. But storytelling in this context, applying it to documentation of evidence in the space of sexual and reproductive health, is a fairly new approach. And in fact, using it in this type of process to produce briefs written by field-based implementers is, from our knowledge, an approach that is one of a kind. What is even more exciting is that our stories have already gained quite a lot of interest and that other units within WHO are now planning similar um, activities. Our aim has been to convey implementation experiences in story briefs that are easily digestible, easy to share, captivating, and inspiring. And as people have different learning styles and communication styles, it is our hope that this innovative approach of documenting and sharing best practices in a storytelling format can inspire more implementers to document their work and also enable a wider audience to absorb this knowledge. Next, please. Now, when trying to capture impact of interventions, of course, quantitative data is important and it's useful. And our stories uh, contain figures to show how their work has really made a real life change for communities and individuals. But what we also managed to do through these stories is to include qualitative data. And, and that really adds context and depth and so many more layers to the numbers and the percentage signs. This way of using qualitative data has given the winning authors an opportunity to convey their work and its impact and, and to really capture details and different dimensions of their impact. And I hope that this qualitative information also will enable readers of these stories to gain a much more rich picture of how evidence and implemented are implemented in real life settings. Because what's really powerful about stories, about depicting challenges and successes in a storytelling format, is that they can connect with people and they are easily relatable. And these stories, I think, really put a human touch and real life faces to the importance of safeguarding sexual and reproductive health for all, and to the importance of spreading know-how on how we can best get there. In a very powerful way, these stories bring to life why we do the work that we do and why these guidelines and tools have, have been produced in the first place. What many of these stories also do is to capture how family planning and SRH interventions also impact other areas that stretch beyond SRH per se, such as education, economic growth, poverty reduction, and gender um, equality. So in this way, these stories highlight how SRH is linked to the broader agenda of sustainable development of individuals, communities, and countries. And in light of that, these stories stress why sexual and reproductive health and well-being uh, is a concern for us all. And because of that, these stories also emphasize the pressing need of scaling up SRH interventions that really work and that work in local contexts. So today you will hear inspiring stories of breaking harmful cultural and social norms, breaking stigma, debunking myths, empowering individuals with evidence-based knowledge and rights awareness, and improving access to information and care. Improvements and changes that ultimately can contribute to ending vicious circles of poverty, of gender inequality, and that can improve health and well-being for all. It's been a very rewarding process to see these stories come to life and to work with our local authors in this process. I'm personally very proud of these stories and of the work that our winning authors have done to concretely improve SRH outcomes in their local communities. And on that note, I would like to hand over to Alex Murray, who will give some remarks on behalf of Knowledge Success. Over to you, Alex. Alex Omari is a public health professional and the Technical Family Planning Reproductive Health Officer at Amherst Health Africa Institute of Capacity Development. He works as the Regional Knowledge Management Officer for the Knowledge Success Project. 
Alex has over eight years experience in adolescent and youth sexual and reproductive health, program design, implementation research, and advocacy. He is a technical working group member for the AYSRH program at the Ministry of Health in Kenya, and the outgoing Kenya country coordinator for the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning. And he's also a website contributor and writer for Strategic EU Journal. Please go ahead, Alex. Thank you so thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to be talking to you today about the process, story creation, and dissemination for the IBP implementation stories. So Knowledge Success is really happy to partner with IBP on this activity, collecting stories to better understand and document uh, uh, real life experiences and lessons learned. Next slide. Next. So I'm going to talk about the selection process. So we began solic soliciting story submissions starting with January of 2020. And we put out a call in English, Spanish, and French. Uh, we received a total of uh, 110 total submissions, out of which 89 were in English, 10 were in Spanish, and 11 were in French. So we had a panel of IBP steering committee members from UNSP, FHI, 360 CCP, WHO and Gender Health, uh, Jeff Pigo, MSH, Pathfinder, USAID, uh, who are part of the steering committee. We also included the core IBP secretariat in the selection process, as well as, well as a couple of uh, the knowledge success team members. So each submission was actually reviewed by two different members of the subcommittee, and we avoided conflicts of interest by ensuring that the folks uh, were not reviewing submissions uh, from their own organization. So we also removed any identifying path details from the submissions. So each, we each reviewed the stories on our own using a scoring sheet and then met and discussed and made our final selections uh, in April, 2020. And then we, we did notify the winners in May and made sure that they were available and willing to participate. So they each received a stipend from WHO for, uh, to write their stories. And we announced the winners to the larger FT community um, in June. So it wasn't, e it wasn't easy to narrow down. We had uh, very many stories. Um, we were initially going to have uh, uh, around three to five stories being published, but we increased this to 15 because uh, we had so many great su submissions. So we ended up with having 12 in English, two in Spanish, and one in French. Next. So how was the selection criteria? So uh, we selected stories based on a number of criteria. Uh, we, looked, uh, we were looking for interesting and unique stories with a clear voice. We were also interested in programs that had a diversity of partners uh, from the uh, government partners, international NGOs, grassroots organizations, and various uh, donors. So we were looking for a clear description of the problem, uh, challenges, and intervention. We also wanted to see some evidence of impact um, either qualitative or qualita quantitative or even both. And since the purpose of these stories was to share real life experiences, we are looking for authors who could clearly articulate their lessons learned and who had some unique experiences implementing the high impact pra practices um, and the WHO guidelines. We're also looking for our story collection to represent a, a range of geographic regions and partners. Next slide. So um, this is where we ended up. And we did end up with the 15 stories that represent a range of experiences, uh, topic areas, geographies, partners, and uh, different tips and guidelines. So the story collection includes um, about 10 different tips and a number of WHO guidelines as well. Next slide, please. So, um, here, we'd like to acknowledge uh, all the authors and organizations who are selected. Uh, they, really, they are really the heart of this activity, and we are excited to have all the stories completed. It's uh, really a fantastic collection and is very diverse with 15 unique experiences highlighted. I will now highlight the different winning stories. As you can see in your slides, uh, we have the winning stories from the different, uh, from the five different countries in uh, the Anglophone Africa, that is, we have Kenya, we have Uganda, we have uh, Tanzania, we have Nigeria, and we have Zimbabwe. Next slide.
So um, the authors drafted and finalized their stories um, and they are now all available uh, as PDFs. So we are currently disseminating these stories via the IBP website and promoting widely on social media. So we ask you to share them with your networks as well. Uh, we are also looking for ways to tell more stories about program implementation um, that others can learn from. If you have recommendations uh, for creative formats, please, uh, you can let us know. Next slide. So as knowledge success, uh, this is, these are some of the activities that we have uh, coming up and the activities that we're working on. So currently we have, um, in East Africa, we do have the East Africa community, FPRH community of practice that looks, uh, uh, looks forward to strengthen the knowledge exchange collaboration and uh, uh, support to FPRH programs. They're also working with a wide range of um, knowledge management champions and youth networks such as the FP2030, Youth Focal Points, and actually IOFP network for dissemination. The other thing also is that we are currently building the capacity of um, uh, youth-led and youth-serving civil society partners within East Africa. And so we look forward to actually doing what's happening in space. So next slide. So with that, thank you very much. I want to take this chance to thank um, uh, our authors, our partners, and organiz our, the organizations that worked on these stories. So as Knowledge Success and IP IBP, we'd like to, we love to hear from you if you have any additional ideas for stories or ways to get this information. So if you want to get in touch, feel free to get in touch uh, via the contact you're seeing on uh, your, your slide up now. Also, let's engage and uh, engage on Twitter to discuss on uh, uh, this uh, uh, kind uh, uh, these stories and actually share more. So the hashtag is hit for FP and uh, yeah, let's have the conversation going. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alex, for that great overview of this project. Um, so that brings us to um, our country presentations. We will uh, jump right in and start with our first presentation from Kenya. Next slide, please. And uh, our first speaker is Paula Taro. Uh, pa Paula Taro is the director of UCLA's Bixby program in population and reproductive health and a drunk professor in the community health sciences department at the US UCLA Feeling School of Public Health. She was the founding co-director of Central Expertise in Women's Health and Empowerment at the University of California Global Health Institute. In Western Kenya, Dr. Taro has worked with the Center for the Study of Adolescence to launch several innovative projects to improve adolescent sexual and reproductive health, including Youth for Youth and Violence on Campus and the After Hours Adolescent Project. Please go ahead, Paula. Yes, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, um, this project is called the After Hours Adolescent Project, uh, which was to expand access to sexual and reproductive health services in Western Kenya. And um, my collaborators on this project were Collins Wanjala and Albert Obui, who are both with the Center for the Study of Adolescence in Nairobi. Next, please. So the first issue that we were trying to address was why don't more rural youths use sexual and reproductive health services in Africa? And essentially, there were three main reasons that we identified. First, that the services are often not confidential. And the youths really uh, fear being seen by others who they believe could report back to their parents. Also, the services are often not convenient. So services are offered when students are in school, uh, often uh, clinics close at 4 p.m. or 5 p.m., which makes it very difficult for young people. And lastly, services are often not youth friendly. Um, so youths often worry about being humiliated or forced to wait long for services. Next, please. So the purpose of our project, which we call AHAP, was to test whether we could indeed make wow. services more convenient, confidential, and youth-friendly. And uh, the uh, activity occurred in Bungoma County in Kenya. You can see that on your map. 
and it was uh, based entirely in government health facilities. Next. So the main components of AHAP were first to extend clinic hours into the evening and also into one day of the weekend to enhance confidentiality for youths so that youths could come uh, and not worry that there would be a lot of community members there who might see them coming for services. Uh, secondly, we hired and trained newly graduated nurses, you can see some of them in this slide, to be more youth focused, to be friendly, to be helpful to the young people. Uh, we also wanted to test whether if we trained nurses uh, to be able to teach comprehensive sexuality education part time, would that help to demystify the services and make it so that young people would get to know them and feel more comfortable coming to the clinics? We also ensured that all the facilities had, at the very least, adequate supplies of condoms at all times and uh, that they had basic lighting because when we started this, some of the clinics did not have uh, electricity, so we had to set up some solar panels to make sure that they would have basic lighting. Uh, we also set up just a very basic youth space with some board games like Scrabble and chess and some informational materials, but that also would be a draw for young people or even an excuse that they could give for coming to the facility after hours to play games or read materials. And um, lastly, we introduced youth client satisfaction cards, which are just small cards that uh, after every encounter, a young person just could quickly tick uh, about the services and put into a box. And we also had after hours registers for the nurses to use. Next, please. So this was a randomized controlled trial. So we uh, invited uh, government facilities to participate after having signed a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Health. And the ones that expressed interest, and this is an example here, Kalumuli Dispensary, that expressed interest in this project, then we randomized them to five that would have the after hours program with the AHAP nurse, but who also would have that AHAP nurse teach part time in schools and in the community. So, for instance, that AHAP nurse, maybe from 11 to 2 uh, during the day, might go out into the community or maybe on the weekend to do some teaching, but then the rest of the time would be in the clinic. Um, and then we had four who only had the after hours program and the AHAP nurse, but the nurse did not go into the community to do CSE. And then we had four facilities randomized to receive no intervention. So then we hired and trained 10 new young nurses, and these nurses were ages 23 to 29, just graduated, males and females. And um, then we recruited some recent high school graduates uh, who we then also trained in CSE along with the nurses. And those uh, high school graduates were then able to go into the community, talk to schools, set up the logistics so that a nurse could just show up and lead a session. So we also encouraged the facilities to be open to at least 6 p.m. on weekdays. Uh, some of them were able to be open even up to 8 p.m. if the AHAP nurse was living right in the compound and also one half day of the weekend. Next, please. So then uh, after the program ran for a year, we evaluated it. So uh, how did we evaluate it? We reviewed facility registers both before AHAP began and then near the end of AHAP. So we took one month, April, and we looked at before and uh, near the end of it. We also did focus group discussions with the AHAP nurses, with youth in facility catchment area, and we also collected and analyzed youth client satisfaction cards at those facilities. Next, please. So our key results were first, that we found that the youth sexual and reproductive health visits to public facilities increased very dramatically, 77 to 97 percent in a single year. So here you can see those that had the nurse, those five facilities that was doing CSE in the community, 
the youth visits increased by 97%, so nearly doubled. Uh, where the AHAP nurse stayed in the clinic, they also went up dramatically, 77%, whereas in the comparison facilities, there was no change at all. Next. Next, please. Uh, we also found that uh, when we looked at when did these young people come, we found that nearly half of them came to those facilities after hours. So as you can see, and in those dark blue, those are the ones with the AHAP and the nurse taught uh, CSE part-time. And so uh, overall, it was a range uh, based on where they were situated and so on, but you can see over half did come uh, after hours. Next, please. And we also uh, analyzed youth clan cards. We were able to collect uh, usable cards, about 1,987. 53% uh, had ticked that they were female, 44% that they were male, and uh, there was a small number who didn't tick the gender. And then we found very high levels of satisfaction, as you can see. Um, nearly 98% said they felt comfortable, and 98% received enough information, 96% had enough privacy, and so on. Uh, next, please. So we then disseminated these results in the community. And during our big dissemination meeting, we found that the community was very supportive. And these are just some comments that were made during the meeting from one assistant principal in a school near to one of the AHAP facilities. He said, since AHAP was started one year ago, we have not had one pregnancy in our school. This has never happened before. Um, an in charge in a facility said, Youths themselves are very particular. If it is an AHAP nurse, they come. If it is someone else, they won't come. Next, please. So what were our key lessons learned? First, the after hours program worked. It really did increase youth's SRH use. It was, uh, it, they found it very convenient, confidential. It helped them to overcome their fears. Secondly, it did matter to demystify the nurses. Having those nurses give CSE talks in the schools and communities did make the youth feel more comfortable. Youth loved being able to come to a facility and ask for an AHAP nurse by name. So they come and say, I want to see Josephine. And if Josephine wasn't there, they would actually leave. Um, so uh, we also found it was really important to do that retraining of nurses because even newly graduated nurses can still harbor very important and harmful misconceptions about contraception. Uh, and also we needed to clarify their values. And then another key lesson was that it's so critical to end stockouts and fees for use. Youth hate to show up somewhere and there is nothing there or they have to pay high fees for tests. And just condoms alone is not enough. Next. So our key recommendations are, First, if you're to do this activity, you must get a commitment from the Ministry of Health that they will continue to cover those AHAP nurses' salaries once the concept is proven. That's really critical to keep this going. Uh, it's also very important to ensure nurses feel comfortable giving those CSE talks because that's something they don't have experience in, so we really give them chance to practice so they feel comfortable. Also, make sure those SRH commodities are there key. We also would suggest that if you're to do this, you consider creating AHAP posters and brochures to help to advertise the program, and lastly, to have community meetings to discuss AHAP so that the community is sensitized to this activity. So we are delighted to answer any questions, and also even after this uh, presentation, there are our emails if you'd like to get more information. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Paula. That was a really inspiring presentation with some uh, quite impressive results there. Uh, we'll go straight to our second speaker, Olofunke Fasave. Olofunke Fasave is a senior director in primary health care, director of programs in Nigeria, and technical lead for sexual, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health program at the Clinton Health Access Initiative, Child, based in Nigeria. Prior to starting her career with CHAI, she worked with the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS in Geneva as a health economics consultant. Please, let us hear our, your um, presentation on the phone. 
Thank you very much and um, good afternoon everyone. I'm really pleased to be making this presentation on behalf of my colleagues at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. So very quickly, I will talk to everyone about the approach that we took in Northern Nigeria to increase access to postpartum family planning services with emphasis on IUDs and implants. Next slide, please. As we probably all know, Nigeria is a country with an estimated population of about 200 million people and is the second largest contributor to the global burden of maternal deaths. Our contraceptive prevalence rate is quite low at only 17% of married women using contraception and we have a high unmet need of 19%. More importantly is even the unmet need amongst postpartum women where the current data available shows that only about 3% of women use contraception within six months post delivery. And so building on the WHO medical eligibility criteria that was updated in 2015, which further expanded the number of modern contraceptives that could be provided in the immediate postpartum period, we implemented this program in 2016 in three states in Northern Nigeria. Next slide. Please. So we worked with the states of Kano, Kaduna and Katsina. The three states combined account for about 25 million people in the country have very high home birth rates, roughly 82% on average of deliveries that occur outside of the health facility and also had very low contraceptive prevalence rates. The aim of our project was to address the key barriers to access for long acting reversible contraceptives. And our focus was really on postpartum women leveraging on the maternal newborn health continuum of care. The key issues that we faced at the time was the lack of adequately trained and competent providers, limited availability of family planning commodities, as well as equipment for providing postpartum, immediate postpartum services, particularly for IUDs. There was also poor integration of family planning and maternal newborn health services and low awareness of postpartum family planning options amongst pregnant women. And so the approach we took had three main objectives. The first objective was really around increasing access points for quality postpartum IUD services with emphasis on scaling up from 30 public health facilities to 682 public sector facilities. To do that, we focused on strengthening commodity security, ensuring that the equipment were available, consumables were in these facilities. We also worked on reorganization of the client workflow emphasizing the importance of women being able to get appropriate information, counseling and referral at all points of contact with the healthcare system and incorporation of postpartum family planning into all the relevant guidelines and healthcare worker protocols, not just for family planning, but in other points of service delivery like antenatal care, labor and delivery and postnatal care. Our second main objective was to then build the capacity of over 1,400 healthcare workers on the provision of immediate postpartum IUDs and implants. And that entailed working with the Federal Ministry of Health to update the national tra training curriculum, expanding the training from just standard traditional didactic, but having a robust clinical mentoring component, which emphasizes competencies and skills building, as well as ensuring that healthcare workers can develop the necessary confidence to continue to provide services. We also work closely with the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists to implement a quality of care project, building on the WHO quality of care standards as well. Our third major objective was then leveraging the role of community influencers, working really closely with them. As I had mentioned in these states, the proportion of deliveries occurring outside of the facilities was very high. Over four fifths of deliveries happened outside of the facilities. And so we worked closely with traditional leaders to increase acceptability of child spacing. We also worked with traditional birth attendants to reach these women, particularly women who do not come to the facilities to deliver. And we worked closely with 
the network of motorbike ambulances that we had created in a prior project to ensure that for women who delivered at home but had opted for an immediate postpartum family planning method, they had access, transportation access, to be able to get to the nearest facility where they could have that service provided. Next slide. So this slide, I wouldn't spend much time on. It just shows um, illustratively how we optimize workflow in the facilities. So you can see that across the different points of contact, we clearly spelled out what kind of information the women would receive on postpartum family planning. And as you can see, we worked with the facilities to ensure that both at the family planning clinic and in the labor and delivery unit services could be provided prior to this intervention what used to happen was if a woman wanted a family planning service she was just referred both for counseling information and everything to the family planning clinic and we saw that there were high dropout rates in that process next slide And so at the end of the program, over the course of the three years, we were able to reach over 147,000 women with immediate postpartum IUDs and implants. So that's basically between 10 minutes after delivery and 48 hours after delivery. Overall, the project reached almost 400,000 women with postpartum family planning. So beyond the 48 hours, we still reached many more women who wanted a, a lack method of their choice. I think two things that we would like to flag based on our experience were one, the role of this project in reaching women who deliver outside the facility. So 36% of the 147,000 women that came for an immediate IUD service were actually women that did not deliver in a facility. But because of the robust community engagement approach that we took, we were able to get as many of those women to come in within 48 hours post delivery. We think that there's also an opportunity here for strengthening other services like increasing coverage of birth dose vaccines, for example, through the approach that we took. The second thing I would like to flag also is the facility insertion rate. So amongst those who delivered in a facility, we saw that the facility insertion rates for the long acting reversible contraceptives postpartum increased from 8% when we started to almost 31% by the final months of the program. Next slide, please. And so what are some of the lessons we learned? I think first and foremost, it's, it's key that in, in every geography, in every country, in every locality, it's important that we understand the local context and we tailor our project design to our local um, context. We, of course, did a lot of literature review. We learned from many other programs in multiple countries, but we still spent an ample amount of time engaging with local community members, with women, with healthcare providers, to understand what the real issues in these three states were. Suffice to say that if we, if we had to implement this in other states in Nigeria, we would have to take a similar approach because no two states in Nigeria are the same. Secondly, we also learned very quickly the importance of sequencing supply and demand intervention. So you definitely don't want to go create demand if you haven't enabled facilities to provide services. And so we built capacity, we provided equipment, then we layered on demand generation activities, and we then ensured that there was a quality of care component to continue to improve the quality of services, make them more client-centered, and to make them more gender responsive as well. The third key lesson learned is around the role of mentorship, supervision, and feedback to healthcare workers. We learned that healthcare workers are pivotal to increasing access to postpartum family planning, both from the perspective of addressing provider bias, but also once they have the right skills and they have the confidence and they truly believe in the voluntary rights-based family planning, um, you know, they, they go a long way in speaking to women, convincing clients, providing them with all the information they need to be able to make an informed choice to receive these services. And so we found that having that bespoke mentoring model, also using a cluster mentoring approach, which created a healthy competition between facilities was critical to achieving the, the goal of the project, as well as some of the results that we saw. Lastly was the role of community engagement. As I said previously, 
um, it's really important to work closely with community members, both in the way that we design and implement the program, but also making sure that they are kept abreast of the progress being made and that they are part and parcel and they feel that this project is tailored for their needs. Of course, we have to be sensitive to um, social and cultural beliefs in the way programs are implemented. And next slide, please. And so we have six key recommendations there. I mean, not, none of these really would be rocket science, but I think based on our experience, these are key recommendations for future implementation. First and foremost is the need to continue to strengthen the capacity of government to manage postpartum FP integration. And to do this, it's important that we have more robust monitoring and evaluation systems and a stronger data management process in place. Secondly, as the previous speaker from Kenya shared, we cannot overestimate the importance of commodity security. Even within a facility, you have to ensure that commodities are available at the different points where services are going to be provided. So before we started this project, we realized that family planning commodities were only available in an FP clinic. And a woman who delivers and wants to receive a service within 10 minutes post-delivery, you can't start moving her to an FP clinic. And so we did a lot of work to also implement contraceptive logistics management in the labor and delivery wards as part of making sure that more women could have access to postpartum IUDs and implants. Thirdly is that you have to provide equipment, you have to fill gaps, and more importantly, because of issues around maintenance and sustainability, building an inventory management system that supports facilities to be able to consistently track how many equipment they have, functionality of these equipment in order to plan for replacement. I think also crucial here is the need to avoid duplication and wastage of resources. And so this inventory management system is also useful for technical assistant partners, implementing partners, so that we do not um, you know, use the same, use our resources to keep procuring instruments without leveraging on already provided instruments. Fourth recommendation is to look into clinic workflows. How do you optimize that workflow to ensure that at every point of care, a woman is able to access the information she needs and she gets the right information, counseling, and referral as applicable. So looking at antenatal care, routine immunization, postnatal care units as key points of contact for the women. Fifth is to engage and continue to work with community influencers. We found them to be extremely instrumental in the success of this program, and we cannot overstate the role that they play in generating demand, increasing awareness, and promoting the use of postpartum family planning. Last but not the least is the role of having a robust referral, having a robust referral mechanism to support women, particularly in settings where a lot of women do not deliver in a facility, so that for those women who have made a decision to access postpartum family planning, they're able to get to the health facility in time to access these services. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to answering any questions. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. We will move uh, right on to our third presentation, which is um, from Tanzania. And may I just please um, remind all our speakers to try to keep within uh, your 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Anna Temba. She's a medical doctor and public health specialist. She has over 10 years of practical experience as clinician, program manager, and technical advisor in the areas of MNCH, family planning, youth, comprehensive post-abortion care, and HIV AIDS. Anna works with Engender Health, where she serves as senior technical advisor for family planning reproductive health at USAID, Goresha Afia Southern Zone Program. She has previously worked with various family planning organizations, including Pathfinder International and PSI. And she also serves as the secretariat of the Tanzania National Family Planning Technical Working Group. Please can we hear your presentation, Anna? Thank you very much, Carol. So good evening, everyone from Tanzania. And I'll be presenting my experience in implementing one-stop shop mobile family planning outreach and service integration in Southern Tanzania. 
Next, please. So I'll also give a bit of a background of our program. So our program is a five-year USAID funded program, which is implemented as a consortium where we have Deloitte as our prime and then in gender health, FHI 360 and MDH as the technical partners. And the program has five key thematic areas, which are HIV, family planning, TB, MCH and malaria. And we, are, we implement these um, activities in collaboration with Ministry of Health and President's Office with, um, of Regional Administration and Local Government. Next. So given the context um, of Tanzania, so we can see in Tanzania, we have almost uh, universal coverage of contraceptive knowledge. However, we still have low CPR at 32% and the nation actually aims to, to reach 47% by 2023. And again, uh, uh, we have high and met need for contraception at 20 and to, uh, uh, around 22 to 24%. And our HIV prevalence as a country is high at 4.9, but even higher among women at 6.3%. And Tanzania committed to the 1990 um, HIV global um, target. However, we are still uh, low at the identification in particular. So 60% of people already know the HIV status versus the target of 90%. And our TB notification is at 49% and we, are, we have human resource constraint at 52%. Next. So, um, why did we choose this high, high impact practice for family planning? So if you look at the, our program, we use mainly the three um, HIPs, the mobile outreach service HIP, um, the family planning uh, and immunization integration and integrating community health workers in the health system. And we, you know, if, we, if, you, read, if you read this um, high impact practice, you see they have a potential to actually respond to to actually respond to the um, challenges that we have I have just shown in um, Tanzanian context. So the mobile outreach and integrated care we've just noted um, have the potential to actually increase the access and uptake of family planning services, including the long acting and permanent methods. Um, we saw the potential um, of integration to increase um, the HIV identification efforts of the country. But we also hoped um, this in, um, intervention will improve the maternal and neonatal health outcome through the postpartum family planning that we, you know, we integrate in the family planning and immunization um, outreaches. But um, the mobile outreach and integrated care have a potential to maximize human resource for health, which, we, as we have shown, you know, in Tanzania we are highly constrained. So um, they, they can, you know, uh, build their potential to capacity building, retention, and bridging the service gaps. Next. Um, so our approach, we have mainly three different uh, outreach approach that we're going to share with you. Um, next, please. So the first approach is the integrated family planning, HIV and TB outreach. So our entry point service is family planning. In Tanzania, family planning outreaches have been conducted for a while. So they also have high acceptance rate. Um, so during the family planning outreach, we would integrate services um, that are HIV screening, testing and linkage, and TB screening and linkage. Um, and these outreaches would target all women of reproductive age, um, as well as men for um, permanent methods. You know, and these outreaches are conducted um, at the facility and would provide all methods, including the short acting, the long acting, and the permanent methods. And the team that is conducting the outreach has a, um, it is a team of five healthcare workers, and it includes the surgeon, an assistant surgeon, two family planning nurses, and one nurse who would actually be managing the client flow, um, ensuring that commodities are available, and you know sterilization is being done, you know continuously during the the outreach, and we don't actually miss a client just because you know we actually need to um, sterilize um, a kit. And this one, um, these outreaches were conducted five days every quarter in, in each council, in each, each supported council of the six regions that the program is working on. And our client mobilization strategy is the public announce, announcement where we'd have people going around the villages and announce about you know, um, the family planning services that is, um, is coming into their um, area. Next, please. 
The second um, approach is the integrated family planning immunization outreach. And our, here, our entry point service is immunization service. So in Tanzania, we have high coverage of immunization service. Uh, so um, they are widely accepted. When we say we have, we're going to have immunization outreach, most women who are, you know, have kids below 12 months and are due for immunization would actually come. So when they come, would integrate family planning services. And so um, this outreach is actually targeting postpartum women, you know, um, in, from delivery to um, 12 months. And they are conducted at the community because um, the immunization outreach uh, generally conducted um, at the community level, um, currently um, as per the guideline. So we'd actually um, go again to the community and provide the services. And because these ones are provided at the community level, the method that we provide are short acting and implant. Um, the IUCD then would have to refer them or carry them to the nearby facility and do it and refer for permanent method in a facility, um, in a facility which um, has theater facilities. And the team is two to three healthcare worker, depending on the catchment population. So if you're going to a population which has, has um, to a catchment area, which is highly populated, would actually carry three providers. If it's, you know, modest, then two providers. And with these providers, one would be pro for provision of immunization services and another one for family planning services. And we actually support three days uh, of these uh, services every month in each council. And the um, client mobilization strategy that we use here is the community health workers and the village leaders. As they would be going around looking for women who are, who are having kids for immunization, telling them of, um, about the outreach as well as the village leaders, or you'd have the announcements placed. Our third um, approach in the next slide is our integration of family planning services at CTC. So here, our key entry point service is HIV and ART refills. Currently, uh, we, uh, people who have been identified to be HIV positive and on treatment are actually coming to receive services regularly. So in that case, ART refills are good and the attendance is good and widely accepted. So when they come, would actually integrate family planning services and cervical cancer screening. So this outreach is actually targeting women living with HIV. And as we've, we've seen in the evidence by ECHO and other studies, you know, if you provide integrated services, including family planning, women are more likely to actually choose um, family planning services, including non-condom um, contraceptives. So these um, um, outreaches are being conducted in the CTCs, HIV care and treatment centers, and will provide all methods, um, the short acting and long acting because they are facility based. However, would refer for permanent methods because we need a theater facility. And the team would have around two to three providers depending on the client load. So one of them uh, would be a family planning nurse and another one would be um, a cervical cancer nurse to provide the services. Um, and again, we actually like to also engage the host facility healthcare workers, you know, for continuation and learning. Um, so these ones are happening five days every month in each council, and we use the community-based HIV service care providers because then um, they already have the attachment to these clients, as we also want to maintain the privacy and confidentiality of the clients. Next. Next, please. So our results. So with these outreaches, what did we reach? Next. Um, so overall, we reached the over three, 300,000 women um, and men with various family planning services, as you can see. We also, again, have a good method mix uh, with over 8,000 mini lab and six um, NSVs through the outreaches. Uh, but again, we, we said we're also providing integrated services. So um, during the outreach, we were also able to identify 194 HIV positive clients that we linked to CTC and 325 cases that were presumed to have TB and who, um, who were linked, you know, with further testing and confirmation. Um, but, uh, you know, as I described the teams, the teams are different depending on the type of outreach um, as well as the duration. So with that, we see most of the clients, we actually reach them through the integrated FP HIV TB. 
um, outreach, followed by the FP service days outreach at CTC and immunization outreach. Next, please. Um, method mix. So overall, in, a current, in our country, uh, method mix is really predominated by injectable. However, if you look at the, uh, at the outreach method mix, we have um, majority taking implants. We have a, sh a fair share of IUCD as well as mini labs. However, the method mix again varies depending on the outreach type. So if we look at integrated uh, family planning and HIV, TB outreach and immunization outreach, we see um, implant dominating. We see um, a significant share of mini lab um, in the integrated outreach as compared to other ones, but we also see a, um, a big share of condoms in the service days outreach because again, these ones are done at CTC and client also enjoy the duo protection uh, that, that they get from condoms. Next. So what are the lessons learned and recommendation? Next, please. So we have quite a few lessons learned. Um, so number one, we, we realized it was very important to train providers to multitask. Because if you're going to have each provider doing each service, then it's not very good use of human resource and financial resource. But again, we also have the client side because then they would have to pass through like five or six providers that you know um, can compromise the privacy and confidentiality. So it's important to have a provider doing multiple services. Um, number two is you know we need to have a strategic selection of um, outreach facilities. Otherwise, we're going to create dependency. Is it so we, um, it's important to graduate facilities once they have achieved um, competency. Like, um, you know, they already have a trained provider, they already have commodities, then you have to move to another facility so that that facility is um, also able to provide services on their own. You know, that which is very important for sustainability. But again, as a country, when you have supportive so policies and guidelines, it's important, you know, like to get a buy-in. For example, a provider to understand like they can they should provide more than one service in tanzania we we have um, an integrated a guideline on integrated services so we use that as a backup to get a buy-in from providers um, but another key lesson that again we learned in this program is important to actually design an integrated program from the start so for example we have hiv we have tb we have family planning mch and malaria in the Ministry of Health, all these are vertical programs, so it will be very hard to actually coordinate and get same results. But then if it's, this is one program implementing everything, then the program has ownership of all key components, and then we keep designing ways to better coordinate and get good results. So I think this is, again, a very key lesson that we had in this program. Um, so um, as I finish with the recommendation in the next slide, so um, the integrated service should be layered on the already established and accepted service. So as I uh, showed, immunization services, uh, we have very high coverage, you know, people already accepting that. So if, and as well as the CTC attendance for ART refills. So we, we can very easily reach out to HIV positive women because they're already, uh, they already coming to the ART refills. Then, um, so that again provide a good platform to add an additional service and you know maximize um, performance of both um, services rather than if you just pick um, a random service. Again, building build capacity building activities in the outreaches. So when we actually go for the outreach, it's also important to build capacity of the host providers. You know, making sure that they're able to manage side effects they are also able to manage removals so that when you when you actually leave the facility, when the clients come back to the facility, they are able to receive the same service. And you know, we should also ensure sustainability beyond the outreach days. And I would just like to insist as per previous um, presenters, you know, we need to make sure commodities are available all the time. We need to, you know, supply equipment because some facilities uh, and settings, they already have budget constraints to buy kits. So it's important to also support the supply of equipment. In example, IUCD and implant removal kits, ensure clinical mentorship for the quality of service, and uh, you know the accountability piece to ensuring that you know services are being provided. And this could be actually done through supportive supervision. Thank you. 
Back to you, Kara. Thank you so much, Anna, for that presentation. And we will move uh, straight on to our fourth presentation from Uganda. Uh, I will again just remind our speakers to try to keep within the 10 minute um, time so we have some time for questions and answers. Um, our fourth presentation is by Irene November. She comes from Intra Health and she's a strategic health communications professional and storyteller with experience in health communication, knowledge management, learning, reporting, documentation, and collaboration. She has particular experience in implementing strategic health communication strategies and campaigns and sharing knowledge and best practices to empower underrepresented populations to be part of the solution rather than the problem in their journey for healthier lives. Please go ahead, Irene. Thank you so much, Carol. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be sharing our experience from the rural corner of Eastern Uganda. Um, this high impact practice is uh, was implemented, was all rather were implemented by uh, uh, Rights E, which is a USID funded and intra health international led project that is implementing. Uh, services in eastern Uganda to ensure that uh, uh, services are of quality and are reaching everyone that deserves this. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so this, the context is, I'm going to focus on the context of Sebei. Uh, Sebei is a mid-eastern, it's based in the mid-eastern Uganda and contains the three districts of Kapshora, Akwen and Buko. Uh, when the region, when we came in the at the beginning, we discovered through the studies that uh, there was low uptake of contraceptives, which was at 13%. And uh, as rights, e, our mandate was to make sure that we're improving quality and ensuring that access and demand for health services is reaching everyone, including those uh, our target audiences in uh, rural eastern Uganda, particularly SEBE cluster. Next slide, please. Uh, so when we did our baseline, our findings indicated by that uh, there were so many several factors that were leading to the low use of um, family planning uptake and, and these key uh, factors included low demand for voluntary family planning, uh, influence of cultural norms such as association of you know, bearing children as a source of wealth. There were lots of myths uh, around uh, family planning, that for example, it's going to cause cervical cancer, you're going to get high blood pressure, and there was also frequent um, stockouts. So as, a, as an activity, we sat down and uh, did a beautiful collaborative intervention uh, that, uh, looked, that looked at the different approaches of how to falter intentional and continuous learning to ensure that our folks who are targeting are uh, receiving these services. So key among the activities that we did when we were starting out uh, is that we had to do map up of uh, key activities uh, we want to do as a, a consortium or as a, co a collaborative that was involving the government, uh, district local leaders, including the district health office, the stakeholders themselves and like-minded uh, stakeholders. And people at the facilities to make sure that we are doing the right thing and delivering these services to the in mouse. So those were some of the key activities that we implemented. Uh, we mapped out the activities, then we went ahead to hold district-based uh, advocacy meetings and budget conferences to make sure that we pull uh, funding to, and to enable us to implement these uh, uh, trainings or these mentorships or these demand creation activities um, to ensure that the end mile is receiving the actual service. We also engaged the district uh, uh, private uh, private sector, especially uh, uh, practitioners, to provide with that for us affordable and uh, uh, accessible methods that we could uh, use at our outreaches or other facility. Okay, next slide, please. Um, at the community level, we also had specific activities that we were doing. We developed radio spots uh, to create demand. We did lots of drama um, to ensure that uh, we demystify the myths, the worries, and we used local, I know, people, local resources within those communities to create awareness, including the cultural uh, folks that people were 
you know, confident and trusting to pass on that message. So we targeted those ones and brought them in as change agents. We also held dialogue meetings uh, to raise awareness and to encourage, you know, everyone to take up these services that we are providing in the nearby, you know, uh, facilities that we are uh, supporting. We also engaged satisfied users, particularly those ones who have used family planning services uh, to showcase and tell their story of how these, uh, these products are safe and they can be used and they can, you know, uh, help a mother or a family to space their children. So we did all this um, in partnership with our different stakeholders that I mentioned above, the cultural leaders, the local leaders, the district partners, and other like-minded partners like Reproductive Health Uganda to ensure that uh, we deliver on this mandate. Of course, as we moved along, we encountered so many challenges and a few of these were when we sent these uh, clients that we have uh, uh, identified or that have come forward to say that I want to take on these methods, we discovered that the health facilities, some of our health workers were lacking in capacity in terms of uh, delivering delivering quality uh, counseling, um, how to deliver a quality service. There were no systems of, uh, you know, there were so, so many poor systems in terms of how do we link these uh, communities to these facilities and how often should they, you know, be following these folks that were targeting with, with the quality services. So we had to, you know, come in and uh, stage interventions uh, at the facility level. And one of those interventions, if you go to the next slide, you will see is that uh, using the World Health Organization guidelines and the training resources package for family planning, we managed to train, orient, and build the capacity of our health service providers at those target facilities in the Sebei cluster. We also adapted the learning approach, uh, which uh, helped us to pause and reflect through peer-to-peer -peer sessions, mentorships, uh, also using WhatsApp, you know, to, if a client is in distress, we quickly, you know, go on that WhatsApp group and say, hey, there's this client in this place, how can you best reach them? So we built a confidence. Uh, we also ensured that the services or the communities are uh, available at the, at the health facilities, that when a client comes in, they don't have to wait for so long. There's a safe space for them to get that service and they're able to quickly, you know, access even other services, other facility. Next slide, please. Uh, so what have been the impact of these interventions? If you look at the next slide, you'll notice that uh, we registered uh, a huge uh, improvement in terms of uh, family planning uptake. Uh, from the 13% at uh, the start of the project, that was in 2017, to a cool 16% uh, percent by 2019, 2020, uh, for that small target audience where we tested and uh, implemented this cooperative. So we feel that uh, if these kinds of interventions uh, are scaled up, they can bring in mileage in terms of increasing and saving lives as regards uptake of family planning. Uh, so what are some of the lessons that we are seeing from this as a right C that uh, implemented this collaborative? We are seeing that collaboratives matter. If you go on the next slide, please, you'll notice that collaboratives matter if you want to move an agenda or have people buying to your, your vision, you need to uh, have a clear vision of what your collaborative is going to be all about. What is your partnership? is all going to be about so once you have a common vision about what you want to achieve at the end of the day then such collaborations are, are going to help you achieve that um of course uh we we achieved all this because we intentionally did uh, for example quarterly meetings uh, these were important moments for us to pause and reflect on what is going on well or what is not going on well, uh, share progress and challenges and make sure that we are moving forward with winning strategies to help us reach our aim, which was to increase access of family planning to our rural folks in uh, Eastern Uganda, particularly for CBE cluster. Uh, we also, during these meetings, we also discovered that when you do consistent data review, it helps in the process of helping uh, stakeholders you know, decide on what's the best way forward. For example, when, when we reviewed our data and discovered that some corner of a section 
X of this comment was troubling with the uptake of uh, services, we could now ask the LC person, those are the local leaders in that particular area, asking them what is happening, why, how can we intervene? And these people had locally rooted solutions, some of these challenges, and we implemented those uh, solutions and were able to see an increase. Then also what we discovered is that uh, these community-led interventions play a key role in challenging the status quo, especially when you're in a community that, that is living in so many cultural practices. So when you bring in the leaders and you've turned them and you've had a change of mind and on your side as advocates, uh, having them as your change agents, they will help you uh, dissolve these fears and address, you know, common issues around concerns, norms that are, are hindering um, uptake of kind, these kinds of services. So it's very key to always include those, you know, unlikely partners in these kinds of collaborations if you want your agenda to be taken up by the community. Um, next slide, please. So we had six key recommendations. Of course, we have a bigger paper that we've submitted, if you see in your chat, uh, that has the whole paper, but I'm summarizing, but uh, this is what we, we've learned over time. Um, holding regional meetings to pause and reflect is key, so one has to be intentional. We, for example, used to have lots of demands from other activities, other donor interests, but we intentionally said we're going to hold these meetings to pause and reflect and agree and document uh, what is working and not working. Uh, we also, within also another second recommendation that I would suggest is, or from our experience as evidence, is that you need to define your expectations clearly so that each of the key stakeholders knows what they are bringing on the table. Otherwise, if you don't have that clearly, there will be um, a lot of um, uncoordinated events, there will be low accountability and low responsiveness to the needs. Yet at the end of the day, you want to make sure that your end mile is receiving that key service that you promised. So when they come at the facility, they should find the environment safe and secure and services available for them. So defining key expectations from each of the different stakeholders that you're bringing on board is key to helping one achieve their collaboration and partnership at the end of the day. It's also key that you review your donor interests so that you keep scouting for new partners. For example, um, at the beginning of this cooperative, we hadn't uh, engaged aggressively with the district health office. So um, halfway through, we discovered that if you want to have a smooth flow of um, implementation at, for example, at the facility level, you need to engage the, dis the district health office to help you uh, sell your idea or sell your agenda to the health, public health facilities, especially if you're working in the public health facility sphere, you need the buy-in of those districts, local officials, especially the health office. For us in this collaboration, they were very key to push the agenda and also involving the other partners who are implementing like-minded implementation projects in that context, bring them on board. For example, we had to do um, a lot of um, collaboration and partnership outreach in Uganda to ensure that we, we achieve our aim and goal. And so reviewing those donor interests so that you all have a similar you know, kind of vision of what you want to achieve is very key. Um, then the fourth one would be that uh, advocating district leadership uh, should be very key. They need to play um, a key role because at the end of the day, this is the only way you're going to achieve your sustainability. When Because these are donor-funded projects, you have five years, you implement and move on. But when you build the capacity of the district leaders, they will continue with those same ideation to ensure that the service, uh, you know, uh, continues on long after you've gone. And one of the best cases scenario from, from advocating district leaders be part of this whole collaborative when we implemented it is that the district, for example, Captura was able to save some money within their district budget to save it for the health facilities that are implementing specific family planning interventions so that when you're long gone and out of that uh, setting, they continue to deliver the services with that small money that they are receiving from the main government. Um, then another recommendation would be that it's very, very important to know who's your stakeholder 
um, that's where you'll be focused. Uh, you you bring on board uh, like-minded stakeholders, and you'll have a clear map, and uh, you'll be able to prioritize the things you want to do. Uh, right from the grassroots up to the Ministry of Health, you know who does what and who can help me overcome this barrier to achieve my intended goal. So it's very, very key to map who your stakeholder is going to be and engage them at all levels uh, for, for the collaborative to be uh, um, a success. So the last recommendation that is key for us from this uh, evidence that we collected as we implemented this uh, uh, high level practice is that our integrating integrating uh, family planning services in other ongoing services in any given setting is key it is uh, efficient uh, time saving and uh, you save a lot of costs so one of the things that we we we, we have sustained is that uh, we've uh, um, implemented or introduced family planning corners for example in the family in the hiv clinics in the areas that we are implementing and we've been able to ensure that there is continuity of service provision when a mother walks in maybe they're coming for the hiv refuse um, the health work at that corner or the desk is able to share and interest uh, a client on these uh, other services outside you know the hiv so and this is also cascaded up to the community level when you're doing integrate uh, outreaches you integrate the component of family planning service privilege so when someone is coming for surgical cancer and you're counseling them they're able to also get information also about family planning so from right e i think uh, these are the, some of the recommendations that we feel can be cascaded and can deliver help us deliver the increase of uh, service provision in rural settings so thank you so much over thank you so much Irene. and that brings us to our last presentation from zimbabwe our last speaker is tarai batasara and he's the technical lead of lead for adolescent girls young women and prevention services with fhi 360 and uh, he's currently pursuing a phd in child sensitive social policy focusing on adolescent girls and young women and he has been coordinating the dreams prep and key populations program in zimbabwe for the past five years with the zimbabwe ministry of health and child care and he has been instrumental in developing various strategies to reach out to adolescent girls and young women in zimbabwe Please see your presentation, Tarai. And if All I right, could ask you. within uh, 10 minutes, so we have time for some questions in there. Thank you. All right. So let me just confirm. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. And okay, are you going to be moving my my slides from that end? No, you, you just say next and we will move to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I think, uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Taurai Patasara. So let me just put a disclaimer, I think, uh, to uh, where I am sitting now. So when we did the implementation story, I was still with the Minister of Health and Child Care as the DREAMS and KP coordinator, including uh, the PrEP uh, program. But uh, since the publication now of the story, I have moved to FHI 360 in Zimbabwe, where I am now as the technical lead, adolescent girls, young women and prevention uh, services. So the issues that I'm speaking about today are in the context of where I was sitting before, not now. So we are talking about um, uh, implementation story around the stop the bus concept, uh, which is an outreach based model. So if there's a way of just giving a background, I think uh, Zimbabwe is one of the higher met needs uh, of family planning, and we are sitting at uh, 10% uh, as of uh, 2018. And our young people continue to face uh, challenges in accessing SRIH services, uh, resulting in high teen pregnancies, low condom knowledge and limited access. So I think this also then uh, is one of the reasons why we had to, uh, to adopt that model to address some of these challenges that I'm, I'm highlighting here. 
Uh, and our health facilities are remain one of our barriers uh, to access sexual and reproductive health services by young people due to the unfriendly environment. Uh, so this is a regardless of the training that has been given to our healthcare providers in the health facilities concerning how they need to treat young people when they come in access services uh, uh, in the public health facilities. But apart from services delivering our barriers, adolescent girls and young women continue to face other structural challenges such as religious and traditional practices, including long distance to the facilities. So this is just, I think, part of the background and some of the reasons why we had to stop the bus concept or the stop the bus model to try and address, I think, some of the challenges and barriers that are relating to access to, um, to our sexual and reproductive health services, in, uh, in particular family planning. So if I may jump in just to think to uh, what is the stop uh, the bus? So this is an, um, a concept which adopted the actual physical bus in itself. So uh, it's, a, it's a bus uh, that uh, is branded uh, with different information, uh, that is then used to offer different services. So this model started in 2016 under the DREAMS program and has since been adopted to other HIV prevention program as a way of reaching out to, to, to young people. So the model itself involves the use of physical bus to offer services to adolescent girls uh, in their localities. Uh, the intervention includes working with communities and drumming up support uh, and buying and mobilization for, for services. So in, um, in the bus, uh, there will be uh, youth-friendly trained nurses um, that, offer, that offer services such as STI screening and uh, uh, treatment, cervical cancer screening. So if you look at the call-out, that blue call-out, you will see some of the services that are offered uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the bus. So before the bus then uh, comes with the, the, the services in the community, we have what we refer to as dream ambassadors, which are adolescent girls and young women who then go into the community to create demand for different services uh, in that particular community uh, prior to the coming of, uh, of the bus uh, into, the, into the community. And in the actual bus, we have physical services that uh, will be offered. So the model was designed to address our challenges related to access, affordability, and availability of uh, voluntary family planning among adolescent girls and young women. So you, what you then find out that in the districts of implementation, the six districts uh, that uh, this was implemented during that time. Uh, but let me also ask them to say, uh, as we speak right now, this has been scaled up uh, to uh, 14 more new districts uh, in the country. So now we have the model in, the, uh, in 20 districts in the country. So what we wanted to address around this is, was the issue around the user fees. I think as one of the barriers uh, to, I think, to accessing family planning uh, uh, services. So young people, I think one of the adolescent girls and young women, had to pay user fees when they go to public health facilities. And we were trying to mitigate this by offering these services in the communities, in the areas where young girls or uh, adolescents do frequent, such as shops, uh, markets where we would go and park our bus and uh, young people to come and access our uh, services in that, uh, in that bus. So we we're also trying to uh, address the issues around availability so that we are then bringing these uh, uh, services to the doorstep of our young people. But it was also adopted to increase uh, safe spaces for family planning, improve uh, the client experience by reducing the time spent, seeking care and remove user fees, which are often uh, cited as a barrier for adolescent girls and young women access to, uh, to services. So I think one uh, uh, common challenge that you probably see in Zimbabwe, the public health facilities, but also in general uh, other countries is the issue around stigma and the discrimination that emanates from our healthcare providers, the negative attitudes that sometimes our healthcare providers do have concerning accessing of family planning commodities 
by adolescent girls and young women. So issues around if you are not married, you're not supposed to be having sex. So why do you need the family planning commodities? So sometimes the parent or the judgmental jacket uh, that our healthcare providers uh, do put on uh, when the adolescent girls and young women visit the facilities really was a huge barrier to accessing services. So we then adopted the concept to address some of these, uh, these issues. Uh, next slide. Oh, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So uh, from uh, when we started, uh, when we started the, uh, the, the, the program, I think in the sixth district, oh, sorry. Uh, can we go back to the successes? Thank you very much. So when we started to implement this, uh, this uh, this uh, this model in six districts uh, in Zimbabwe. I think uh, for that particular period, 2016 to 2019, we managed to reach out to 8,570 adolescent girls and young women uh, with the voluntary family planning methods. So here, I think you can see uh, one of our buses uh, where um, adolescent girls are queuing, I think, to, uh, for their turn to get into the bus uh, to access our uh, services. So I think uh, this was one of our successes because we managed to increase uh, the number of people, uh, adolescent girls and young women who were accessing voluntary family planning methods by bringing the services to their communities. So even one of, uh, I think if you look at, I think of uh, some of uh, the, 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 the story, you can see that I think there are voices from the community where adolescent girls and young women were saying, you know what, I feel safe in getting the services from the bus. I don't have to look over my shoulder to see who is watching and who is looking at me because I'm accessing these services in a space where I'm not judged, where I feel that I'm wanted and I'll be supported for me to, uh, to, to, to get these, uh, these services. So the trained nurses, I think, in those buses where I think are trained on youth friendly service provision and uh, on how they should uh, respond and work with uh, adolescent girls and young women. And it became a popular bus uh, in the communities where we are uh, operating in. But I think one of also, I think uh, the success stories that we experienced through this model was also to reduce distances traveled to access uh, services to facilities. So if you look at our rural Zimbabwe, the setup that is uh, we do have is that we do really have uh, quite long distances that people have to walk to go to the facilities. And in due to religious and some traditional nature and practices that happens at community level. So if an adolescent girl and if a young woman wants to go and, uh, to the facility to access services, because of distances, sometimes they have to walk, to physically walk to the facilities. And because they do have to walk, they are then either by default accompanied by a caregiver or a parent or a brother from the household uh, to the facility for them to go and access a service. And in most cases, they have to go to a facility because they are not feeling too well. Of which we can all agree that when you need family planning say, uh, commodities, it, uh, you probably are in good physical uh, stature, you are not sick. And sometimes for you then to be uh, to wait for you to be sick and then go and uh, access your uh, uh, services, it takes probably a, a long time. So we, that and uh, those some of the scenarios and the cases that you have to accompany an adolescent or a young woman to a facility. Uh, and it also then reaches issues to do with confidentiality. When they are accompanied to the facility, they are not feeling safe to access the services that they want because they are afraid that either the nurse or the healthcare worker might reveal this to their family. So by bringing this service at a central point in the community, adolescent girls and young women uh, were able to just walk to a, a nearby area where the bus is parked and they can access the services. Provided safe space for adolescent girls 
and young women to access family planning and other SRF services. So while I think I'm um, speaking more on family planning, there are other SRF services that are also, be, uh, were also being offered in the past, such as your STI screening and treatment, your cervical cancer screening, uh, your HIV testing, uh, and uh, also counseling, and also referrals uh, that uh, we made, I think, to other DREAMS partners, I think, within, uh, from the past. But see, also, I think one of the key successes was uh, our ability, I think, using the past to be able to address stigma associated with visiting local youth facilities by young people to access uh, family planning services. So I think I spoke uh, uh, briefly, I think, around issues to do with stigma and discrimination that are usually associated with young people coming to a public health facility to access uh, family planning uh, services. So I think our um, young people, our adolescent girls and young women, were really uh, very much happy by having that safe space where they can go to and uh, have their, 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 that time on their own to be able to access uh, these uh, services. Uh, next slide. Sorry to interrupt you, Tarai, but if I can please ask you to wrap up quickly uh, your last few slides as we only have uh, a few minutes left. We're running out of time. So if you could take one minute to just uh, wrap up. Please. That's all right. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, so in terms of I think some of the lessons learned, so I think what we learned, I think uh, this, we probably learned a little bit of a hard way uh, uh, that we needed to involve uh, the youth in program implementation. Uh, and it was a very important lesson for us to make sure that we then involve our adolescent and young women as ambassadors to drum uh, support, I think, for this particular intervention. But uh, training adolescents is, uh, and young women as dreams ambassadors to empower them to reach out to their peers was also a very important lesson for us. But also engaging community get, uh, gatekeepers helped ensure the buy-in and address some of the traditional and uh, religious uh, barriers but also bring voluntary family planning and reproductive health care closer uh, to the areas where adolescent girls and young women are frequented, increased the uptake of uh, the family planning uh, commodities. But also I think the outreach model created a safe space, I think for adolescents, uh, and also the use of an outreach jobs are rich adolescent girls and young women in hard to reach areas. So in traditional areas where we would not be able reach under normal circumstances, we would be able to reach, I think, through the use of our bus and taking the services up into, uh, to those areas. So this is, I think, one of the picture of one of the buses, I think, with, uh, with some of the messages that are there. We can move on, I think, to the next slide that is looking at uh, recommendations. Right, so I think um, as part of, I think, um, uh, of uh, the, the recommendations, Right. As part of, so as part of the recommendation, I think it was also very important that while we're engaging, uh, engaging adolescents, I think was also very critical uh, to, uh, to make sure that they go around the community and, uh, and mobilizing other adolescent, uh, adolescent girls. And also, I think, uh, to think beyond our voluntary family planning, I think uh, mobile services uh, can also work very well uh, in making sure that we reach to other adults and girls and provides other opportunities, I think, for other services, I think, to be uh, to be offered, I think, within that particular uh, within that particular space. But also, I think, use of uh, entertainment, uh, entertainment, uh, which we also combine uh, when we are also giving uh, the services. I think uh, during this talk, the past. Um, 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 intervention has also proved to, I think, to, to, to work very well. So it will also good that if we are going to be uh, doing this, you also pair it up with entertainment, where you are also giving information while least adolescent girls and young women are also then uh, accessing our services. So uh, I can simply say, I think um, this has proved, I think, to, uh, to be a, a popular mo a model popular concept with our adolescent girls and young women. And I would like to want to acknowledge, I think, the following partners, uh, previously the Minister of Health and Child Care, which I was sitting before, and uh, the DREAMS implementing partners, uh, FHI 360, 
uh, world education, our uh, gatekeepers, and uh, also our communities. Otherwise, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity for me to walk you through this presentation. Bye-bye. Great, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. So we're running a little bit over time, but I hope that that most of you can stay for maybe a few more minutes so we can go through some questions and answers. Uh, there have been some uh, questions asked in the question box. We might not uh, have time to go through all of them, but we will we will try to answer a few of them. So um, if um, if you speakers can just try to provide a very quick uh, answer to any questions that I will ask. So there came in a question to Paula about the first story on, on Kenya and the After Hours Adolescent Project. Um, um, one question is, was there an incentive for nurses and how were they met? Uh, there, were no, there were no particular incentives for nurses. Uh, these were new nurses who are unemployed. We hired them, uh, we trained them, and uh, we didn't even pay them uh, the going rate, frankly, uh, because uh, the project was so small. Um, and um, but they really enjoyed the activities, and um, we had a very high retention. We we trained ten, and at the end of the project, we still had eight on board, and um, they they just enjoyed working with the young people and uh, so on. So there was no uh, real problems there, and no special incentive. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. Um, then we had a question for Irene and your story from Uganda. Um, one of the part um, participants is asking, um, did you look into factors explaining the differences in impact in the three districts? Well, repeat for me that question you're breaking, Carol. So the question was, did you look into factors explaining differences in impact in the three districts? Of course we did. Uh, we did, uh, though that information I didn't uh, put it out there, but we did look at the differences. Each of these uh, districts is unique and when we're implementing this intervention, we had to ensure that we implement um, a unique uh, uh, collaborative or strategy for these uh, different districts, the three districts. So yes, we did. Yeah, over. Okay, great, thank you. So um, I think we uh, need to move on to our closing remarks. Um, of course, um, these, uh, these stories can be downloaded and read and, and hopefully you can get answers to, to some of your questions also through reading the actual stories. Um, so I would like to once again uh, hand over to Alex Omari for um, some closing remarks. Uh, and if I could just ask you, Alex, to um, keep it short. Thank you. Alex, do you have any reflections to wrap up? Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for participating today. And um, really nothing much from me. Uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you online on social media, sharing the stories and uh, learning from each other. So remember the hashtag is uh, hips for fp Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you, Alex. And, and I will uh, move on to to what you were just saying about that we would really appreciate if, if you not only read the stories, but also share them. Um, that's exactly what I was going to say that, um, of course, stories are little used if you do not read them and if you do not share them. So please, um, I hope that this um, hour and a half has inspired you to download and read all these stories that were told today and, and, uh, and the rest of the stories. We have 15 of them. You see the links over here. You can download them from ibpnetwork.org. And um, our next webinar in this series is actually coming up already on the 10th of June, and it will cover stories from Asia. So please um, make sure to register already today. We will uh, upload the recording from this webinar as well as the slides uh, to the IVP network platform in the next coming few days. So you will have ample of time to, to um, access all these um, links and, uh, and slides. So on that note, I would like to extend a warm thank you to all of our speakers today and to all of you who joined as participants and uh, hope to see you on the next webinar on the 